Hello, it's Jason Heath coming to you with another episode of Contrabase Conversations. This is a less traditional episode today, a solo show, and we are talking today about how to start a podcast. And before getting to the specifics on how to start a podcast, here are some thoughts on why you might want to start a podcast. Uh, and podcasting has done so much for me career-wise, it's really why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I never set out to have it be that way, but having now done what I've done, I realize the benefits of having a podcast. So here are some reasons why you might want to start a podcast. Number one, it's a great opportunity to have deep conversations with people that you'd want to chat with anyway. I mean, I've been able to sit down with Gary Carr, Larry Grenadier, Miles Mosley, Ron Carter, Come on, who wouldn't want to talk to those folks and talk about subjects of interest to them, of interest to me, get into specifics, go deep. It's such a wonderful educational opportunity. Uh, number two, it's a chance to hone many skills. Podcasting is a combination of research, public speaking, listening, improvisation, it's stuff that we all can use in other areas of our life, and podcasting is a great way. If you just look at it as personal development, it's a great thing to do. Number three, it's an opportunity to differentiate yourself. I forget what the numbers are here at the start of 2018, but there are however many millions of blogs, and then podcasts are just a fraction of that. And even though we are living in a world of video and we are all doing more and more video and consuming more and more video, there's something particular about audio. It reaches you when you're doing other activities. It's a great secondary activity for when you're driving, you're working out, or doing something where your hands are occupied but your brain is free, uh, to riding on the train, whatever, right? We have more and more of that time, I think, as citizens of the world these days. And so podcasting can connect with people when their eyes or their hands are busy, but they can think and and absorb. And it's just a wonderful format for that. And then number four, it is a wonderful skill to add to your skill stack. It, I love the concept of the skill stack. That's something that Scott Adams, who is the author of Dilbert, talks about, about how most of us do something that's really a combination of many skills. Like if you just say, for example, basketball, what is basketball really? That's really a combination of so many things, running and jumping and catching and memorization and, and all these routines and you name it. I do not play basketball very well, so it's maybe not a great analogy, but anything we do in life from playing an instrument to doing something like a podcast podcast is is made up of many skills and taking those skills that you learn doing a podcast that research public speaking listening um, improvisation all those things those make you uniquely employable and valuable to people in so many different ways so those are some reasons why you might want to start a podcast but this episode is largely about how to start a podcast because there are a lot of questions about that and I want to just go through and hopefully eliminate some confusion and share some lessons I've learned in now, this is my 12th year of podcasting, coming up on 450 episodes. Before we dive into that, I do want to give a shout out to our sponsors who make this all possible, the Upton Bass String Instrument Company with their car model Upton Double Bass. This car model bass represents an evolution of their very first car model, and it has been refined and enhanced with further input from Gary Carr. They have done so many innovative things in the bass world, and they have been wonderful supporters of everything that I've done online for years and years. Check them out at UptonBass.com, and thank you guys for sponsoring the podcast. And thank you to Diderio Strings. Check out their Zyx Strings. These are super cool synthetic gut strings. What an amazing sound. Pizzicato under the bow. You can play an open D and go get a cup of coffee and come back and it's still ringing. I just am a huge fan of everything that they do. Love the Zyx strings and you can learn more about everything that they're up to and the strings that they offer at ContraBaseConversations.com slash strings. Thank you also to Robertson and Sons Violins. 
If you've never been to Albuquerque or have never been to Robertson's, get yourself to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and check out the Robertson's showroom and play some bases in there. Oh my goodness, you will just not know what to do with yourself. I'm like a kid in a candy store when I go down there playing things from the 1700s, 1800s, the 1900s, all the way up to contemporary bases made by great luthiers like Trevor Davis, former podcast guest. They are big supporters of the base community. You see them at every major trade show, and they are one of the leaders in base innovation and one of the best places to look for a new base. RobertsonViolins.com is the website, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast. And thank you also to George and Tom Martin and Martin Lawrence, who are coming out with the English Double Bass book. This book examines the great masters of double bass making of the 18th and 19th century. It illustrates in great detail, fine detail, the work that they produced. And it explores the fascinating story of how the double bass came to England, its development, and the rise and fall of the English double bass makers. You can get your copy, order your copy now, limited edition copy at www.theenglishdoublebass.com. Okay, we outlined some of the whys on starting a podcast. Now we're going to get into the nitty gritty on how to start a podcast. And I wrote a series of articles for Drew McManus's wonderful site, Arts Hacker, artshacker.com. It is the Arts Hacker's Guide to Podcasting. And so I'm going to go through this here for this episode. And I wrote this in early 2016. Some things have changed, many have not. And I'd like to share these thoughts and observations and recommendations with you. Everything that I talk about is available in the show notes, and it's specifically available at artshacker.com, but you can just click click through to contrabaseconversations.com, you'll, you'll find it. So we divide this into three parts. Part one is hardware, part two is software, and part three is distribution. So let's start with part one hardware. What do you need to start a podcast? Well, you need a computer and you need a microphone and possibly some other gear. So picking hardware for your podcast, the first thing you want to do is think about what kind of podcast you're going to do. And podcasts generally fall into one of three categories. Solo shows, what you're listening to right now, me yakking in my San Francisco pad into a microphone. That's a solo show. What I more frequently do, interview shows, me talking to somebody else, perhaps live, perhaps over Skype or FaceTime or something like that. And three, event recordings. That could be a concert, that could be a keynote, that could be a lecture. So all three of those podcast types fall into different categories in terms of hardware that you need. Now, some podcasters stick with one format while others mix it up from show to show. I definitely use all three formats, though most of my shows are, if you've listened for any length of time, most of them are interview format, at least at this point. Always subject to change. So regardless of what type of format you're going to do, you need a microphone and you need a computer and probably some sort of mobile recording device for in-person interviews and that sort of thing. So any computer will work, but recording devices are a little bit trickier. I used an Acer laptop for years and years. I wanted to kick it across the room more often than not. Finally moved over to a MacBook in 2009, maybe, or something like that. And I've just sort of been using the Mac since then. But sometimes I record on my iPhone. Sometimes I record on my iPad using a lightning mic. That is generally not what I recommend. But, you know, sometimes you just want to get the interview, get the video, get the photo, whatever piece of gear you have is the best. Better get an okay documentation of whatever event you happen to be at or whatever conversation you happen to have. You know, so sometimes the best gear you have is the gear in your pocket. But let's just assume you're going to invest in some gear. I recommend, and this is a longtime recommendation for many, many podcasters, the Audio-Technica ATR2100. This microphone can be found for around $60 most of the time. Look for it on Amazon or look in the show notes, and it is a great value. 
you. It works as a USB mic, which is great when you're starting out because you can just plug it into your computer and chat away. It also works as an XLR mic, which is great when you're starting to upgrade and maybe use something a little more complex. So the ATR2100 is wonderful. One word of warning is it does the USB uh, whatever hardware on there is notoriously bad and went bad for me after about a year. And that is a very common experience that I've heard from lots of people. Now the mic still works fine as an XLR mic. And at this point I'm recording through an audio interface, which I'll chat about in a second, but that's, that's just something to consider. But for $60, I would rather buy two ATR 2100s and let one die and then use the next one rather than go up a few hundred dollars in price for something else. It is a great mic. And because it's a dynamic mic, which is a great thing for podcasting, it does an excellent job of filtering out background, back, back roined, background noise. And that's great for podcasters because nobody's ever recording in an ideal audio environment. I am here in my San Francisco pad and when I when I really want perfect audio, I I uh, I go into my closet. <laughs> this is a very common podcaster trick. Or if I'm in a hotel, I will go into the closet, and there are all these clothes, and it makes a great sound booth. I am right now in a corner of my workspace, and there are a lot of right angles and plaster, and it sounds really bad. And I'll show you. I'll get away from the mic. And you can probably hear how horrible this sounds. This is the room noise. And if you have, I will get back on the mic now. If you have a condenser mic, that is going to pick up a lot more room noise than a dynamic mic. I use a Shure SM58, which is a rock and roll mic. I can take this mic, throw it at a brick wall, pick it up, and it'll work fine. It's what people have used for a long time. They're great mics. They go for about 100 bucks, so a little more than the ATR2100, and they need phantom power. You need some kind of power source. So again, my recommendation starting out is the ATR2100, but if you move ahead and you need multiple mics and blah, blah, blah. We'll talk about it in a second. The Shure SM58 is my baby. It's nothing fancy at all, but it works great. So uh, the other things you might want are a pop filter or some sort of pad around the mic. So I have this foam pad on my mic. And let me talk. I'm going to talk right into my mic and say some peas. If I say some peas, you're probably getting some peas. But if I took the the foam Wachimahu off, it, it'll definitely be uh, much worse. You can also get these big pop filters and those work great. But my just my like foam padding seems to work better. And that way I can just break this mic out in an event and give a little bit of of plosive, they call it, uh, plosive uh, reduction. I try to wash these things out from time to time just so that you, people aren't talking on the same uh, filter that hundreds of other people have, but that's great. So for basic podcasting gear, the ATR2100 and some sort of foam cover or filter. I would also highly recommend some kind of mic stand the, the ideally doing some sort of arm stand is best so that if you bang your desk, you can't hear it. I just the my funky little work environment. Uh, it's better now than my last place, but it's just not ideal for an arm stand. So I'm on the desk. So if I, I will drum on my desk, you can probably feel I know I'm being super annoying in this episode, but you could probably hear that. So that's that's why you want an arm stand. Just any sort of uh, knocking around you won't come through if you have that. But just any sort of stance, you can keep the mic near your mouth is great. Uh, for an intermediate setup, so this goes into the in-person world and recording events and that kind of thing, uh, I recommend the... Um, I recommend getting some, and this is also true for advanced setup. So I recommend getting a, some sort of portable recorder. My favorite is the Zoom recorders and specifically the Zoom H6. I use that and I have two Shure SM58s that I use for two person interviews. I also have some other XLR microphones that I use for three or four person interviews. And this Zoom H6 is a rocking little piece of hardware. I can have four XLR mics in there and it records to four different channels. 
And what I do is I just have people hold the mic and hold it relatively close to their face. That means they don't have to carry around mic stands uh, and I don't have to show people the exact placement. I, I just try to make sure that they keep it fairly close to their mouth and I have some sort of foam uh, plosive, uh, you know, sort of absorbing device on it just to keep people from, you know, popping their peas and that kind of thing. So that gear is fantastic. The H6 is great. The H4N or some of the, or the H, any other zoom device I'm a fan of, but uh, if you're going to throw down some money for one of these, I'm, I'm a fan of the H6. It's a few hundred bucks. It's not cheap, but it's super useful. So that's part one, hardware. And again, to summarize, ATR2100 and some kind of laptop will get you going. If you want to do things in person, I highly recommend getting a portable recorder like the Zoom H6 and a couple of microphones. I would not recommend using just your computer because with USB mics, you really are just plugging one mic into your computer. And if you're going to plug multiple mics in, you need some sort of audio interface to plug into. Also, if you're starting to use mics like the Shure SM58, you need some sort of phantom power, which Zoom or many of these other companies will provide. So I have gain on each one of the controls. I can boost my mic or cut my mic a little bit or my guests. It's a great solution that allows me to take my recorder, my microphones into a restaurant or a noisy bar or something like that. And as long as I keep my mic close and my guest mic close, I get a great interview. It's so wonderful. If you bring in your laptop and a USB mic, you're going to be asking for a world of uh, at least horrible, painful editing after the fact. Moving on, that was hardware. Now we're moving on to software. And this is, again, based on this article series that I'm linking to, but a few things have changed in the software world. But we'll talk about three different types of software used to put together a podcast. Number one, we'll talk about recording software, specifically recording interviews, and even more specifically, remote interviews. Then we'll talk about editing software. Number two, editing software. Number three, digital audio workstation, or DAW software. Now, this is where things have changed. When I wrote this article, Skype was the most common tool for recording audio interviews. Skype is still common. I use it a lot, but it is a giant pain in the you-know-what. And in terms of quality, it's just amazing. It seems like it gets worse and worse every few months. And, and I've had more problems with Skype than I have with other options. So yes, I use Skype. Uh, it's another, like I said earlier, I would rather get the interview not using exactly what I want than not get the interview. Many, many people have moved over to Zoom, zoom.us. Now, I did not write about Zoom in this article because I wasn't aware of it, it or I had heard vaguely of it, but it has rocketed to prominence. It's a great video conferencing tool. And I recommend if you're doing an interview, use video if you can. Being able to see the person if you're doing it remote is so great because it gives you a little bit of that feeling of in-person. It's not as good as in-person, in my opinion, but it works really well. So Zoom is a great option. Skype is a great option. I also use FaceTime. And recently I've been using just good old Facebook Messenger video calls. Now, neither Skype nor FaceTime record right out of the box. So there's a company called Ecamm that I use on the Mac that makes a call recorder for both Skype and FaceTime. It's not free, but it works well and it seems to be quite reliable. There's also a PC alternative for Skype called Pamela and links are available in the show notes to all of this. Something else that I've been doing recently is using a program called ScreenFlow, which is screen capture software. And and that is a hundred bucks. It might even be more than a hundred bucks at this point. So it's a little bit more of an ask, but that allows you to record any audio however you want it. And it's been quite stable. I've had no crashes or anything in terms of that. I use that for all sorts of screencasts when I need to show someone how to do something on the computer. I just make a video and upload it on listed to YouTube. It works great for recording, and that's what I have been using recording Facebook Messenger calls. Zoom has a built-in record feature, though honestly, I think the last Zoom talk I did, I think I recorded using ScreenFlow just because I'm so comfortable with it. 
So these days I use Call Recorder for Skype, Call Recorder for FaceTime, and I use ScreenFlow. But if I was going to spend money on one thing, it probably would be ScreenFlow right now. Fantastic piece of software. It's been around for maybe eight years and really, really powerful. Now, audio editing software. You need some sort of software, or most people do, to edit out pauses, unwanted sounds, and normalize levels and reduce noise and all that kind of stuff. There's a debate always in the podcasting world of taking out verbal crutches like um, ah, you know, stuttering, misstatements. I, I do it. I've done it for a long time. I will continue to do it. I don't know how necessary it is, and I know a lot of podcasters do not do that. They just let things go, and I'll tell you, that saves a lot of time letting things go. The danger, just having done a lot of these, with just putting out things raw is you lose that safe space that you get if you do say that you edit. So what I do is I edit, but I edit much more lightly than I used to. I take out some ums and ahs and awkward pauses, but not all of them, just some, or anything the guest asks to take out or any sort of obvious, you know, going off the rails or coughing or anything like that. I want a product that the guest will want to share with their community because that's how podcasting grows. If I make an episode with somebody and they don't feel like they sound good, they're not going to share it. I wouldn't share something where I sound foolish or weird or awkward. So your job, this is how I see it, your job as a podcaster in the editing role is to make your guests sound as good as possible. So I use... This is old school, but I use Audacity because it works really quickly for taking things out. It's it's just what I'm used to. I know there are a lot of other options. I used to use SoundForge, Sony SoundForge on the PC back in the day. Lots of different options out there. Now, for reducing background noise and balancing levels, there are three programs. I've used all of them. Levelator is a great one. It is free. It is both PC and Mac. The problem is it's it's not being developed anymore, but I think they made it open source. So the, the open source community does update it for the most recent uh, OS, at least on on Mac. Uh, I'm on High Sierra, and it still works on High Sierra. So I'm always worried Levelator is going to disappear, but it still works. Auphonic is an online option that's free for limited use. Then you have to pay. And then for reducing and just kind of cleaning up sound, there's a great plugin called Sound Soap that I've owned for years. It's $100, but it works about as well as anything I found. A little goes a long way in terms of that. Now, digital audio workstation software, there are many options, and this is where you put your podcast together. You assemble your podcast. So typically, I record my podcast that's using software, option number one. I edit my podcast using a different piece of software, and then I put it together in my DAW of choice, which is Ableton Live. I am the first to admit that that's not a normal (laughs) choice for a podcaster. I used to teach electronic music, and I'm very comfortable with that software, and so I use that. Most people on Mac use GarageBand, which is free, or if you want to kind of take it up a level. Adobe Audition is a wonderful piece of software, and Adobe Audition is great for cleaning up your audio too. So you can kind of work both of those levels, both the editing and the assembly in Adobe Audition. Pro Tools, of course, is a wonderful piece of software, and there are many other pieces of software like Logic, Apple's Logic, Cubase, and many others. But I use... Uh, Ableton Live. You go, oh, you can also use Audacity to assemble a podcast. No problem. I used to use Audacity. Then I use GarageBand. I currently use Ableton Live. I have a lot of colleagues and other music podcasters that use Adobe Audition. So find something that works for you. Links to all of them are available in the show notes. Moving on to part three, which is distribution. Now you have a finished product, some sort of file that says .mp3 at the end of it is sitting on your computer and you want to get it out to the world. 
How do we do that? That is the big question. And there are many ways to do it and many ways that work better than other ways. So the deal with podcasting is you do not want to put these files just on your regular old web host. Let's say you have a website, like I have jasonheath.info, which I never mentioned because it's just like my online business card site. What I would not want to do is to take my podcast episodes and put that on that web server. You could do that and it would probably be okay for the first episode. But what happens with podcasting is it gets published and all these people hit that file at the same time in any website host pretty much with that violates their terms in some way even if it's hard to find it's you will have a very limited shelf life being able to do that and also you might not run into problems until you've put out maybe 10 15 even 20 episodes and you start to get a following because what happens is someone discovers episode 20 then they say oh this is cool i want to download all of them well then your web server all of a sudden is getting hit and each one of these files might be between 25 and 50 megabytes Well, if someone's downloading 20 of those, that's a lot of data. And if even two or three people are doing that, that's a lot of data. Or let's say you have an episode that gets really popular and all these people discover it. There are all these things that come into play and it's just very, very, very smart to find a podcast web host. I use Libsyn. Blueberry is another popular company and there are many others as well. But Libsyn starts at five bucks a month and the plan I have, which is a pretty Cadillac plan. I think I pay 50 bucks a month and I have an app and I have, I could upload, you know, hours and hours and hours a month. No problem. You also want some stats and these web, these podcast specific web hosts will give you all kinds of stats about where people are listening, what platform they're consuming them on, when they're listening. So you can learn a lot about what's popular and how it's being consumed. So Libsyn, Blueberry or other options are out there for you. My personal preference is Libsyn. I've been using them ever since I started. They are, in my opinion, the gold standard for podcast hosts, and they're very affordable. So little plug for Libsyn there. Now, setting up distribution channels. So you got a podcast, you've got your MP3. First of all, you have to get it up online in a way that people can access. That is where something like Libsyn comes into play. But how are people going to actually get this episode. How is it going to get out into the world and get populated and people access it? The first way is iTunes or Apple Podcasts, they're starting to call it. But that is the number one place that you want to have your podcast listed. And this is something, again, this is all in this article, but this is something that has changed in recent months. I would say the number two place you want your podcast is in Spotify. And that's another reason to go with Libsyn because Libsyn has a deal with Spotify, at least at the time of this recording, to put your show into Spotify. You just fill out your Spotify info and within a week or so, maybe a couple weeks at most, your show is in Spotify. Why Spotify? Well, it's a great way to connect with people that are not on Apple devices. And Apple devices have been dominant in the podcasting world for so long. It's so sad that there hasn't been a really good universal PC alternative. There is Google Play Music, but it is really a substandard Pod, suboptimal podcast consumption experience. If you're listening to this on Google Play Music, that's awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. But just everything I've read and researched, people seem to have a hard time really downloading a show and connecting and following with a show the way you can in Apple Podcasts. So Spotify makes it easy. That's a great way to do it. And there are so many other ways to get your show out there. The great thing with getting it in iTunes, and Libsyn will set this up for you. They'll they'll make it easy. You can also do it directly through Apple, but you can also do it through Libsyn, is most of the other directories and places that list podcasts, they go through it and pull their information from the iTunes directory. So if you're in iTunes, you will be everywhere. Now, there are all these other channels as well. You can publish directly to Facebook, directly to Twitter, directly to Tumblr, and many other places, and this can all be done through Libsyn, so it saves you a lot of time, and all of this is tracked within, oh, LinkedIn you can even publish to, and all of this and how people consume it and if they listen to it and where they listen to it, this is all tracked so you know where you're connecting with people. 
I also have an app. I highly recommend making an app for your podcast. It is time and money, but in my opinion, it's well worth it. Why? Because still, at the time of this recording, only about 50% of people, at least in the U.S., know what a podcast is. So if you are trying to get people on board with your podcast, you describe that you're doing a podcast and what you're doing. The average American only has a 50% chance of even knowing what you're talking about. But almost everybody, I don't know what the what the percentage is, but almost everybody, I would guess 90%, at least, of people know what an app is, probably over 90%. Having an app gives you real estate on that person's mobile device, and that is powerful. And on iOS, you can even set up push notifications. It's the only way with podcasting you can reach out and actually let somebody know on their device through a push notification that you have a new episode. That is powerful. So it's not super complex, but not super straight ahead either. There are a lot of little steps, and that's all, again, listed in this guide. So think about an app. Get going. You don't have to start an app right away, but I would highly recommend thinking about it for the future. And then publish, get going. The best time to start a podcast is five years ago. I love this line. And the second best time is right now. So if you want to do it, do it and get it out there and get started and be consistent. Try to put out something once a week, if possible, that would be great and have a great time. It's a fantastic medium. It's super flexible. It has elements of pirate radio. It has elements of public radio. It has, it's this amazing distribution channel that nobody controls except you. Nobody can take this channel away from you. And once you build an audience on that, it doesn't matter if Facebook comes and goes or bans you or Twitter does the same thing or whatever. The the beauty of that channel, it's called RSS, the way that you connect with people. The beauty of that channel is it is, it is just a direct distribution channel between you and the people that are following what you're doing. Love it. I've had a great time doing it. It's not the easiest thing I've ever done in my life for sure, but it's one of the most satisfying things. And I'd like to thank you for listening to this. Hopefully you had a good time with this episode. Obviously it is basically not about base today, uh, tangentially or not at all, but most of what we do here is about base. And I really appreciate you tuning in. Feedback at Contrabase Conversations will put you in touch with me. And I respond to each and every email I get and All of our episodes going back now we're on our 12th year are available at our website, ContrabasConversations.com. Thanks again for tuning in and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.